Thank you. The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 7156 in the name of Richard Leonard on Caledonian Sleeper Service. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I would ask those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Richard Leonard to open the debate. Up to seven minutes, please, Mr Leonard. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I begin by uh, referring members to my voluntary register of interest? Can I also thank those members who signed the motion today uh, enabling this debate? In so doing, uh, you have honoured a commitment to all of those who care not just about our railways, but to all of those who care about parliamentary democracy and open government. Next month marks 150 years of an overnight rail sleeper service running from Scotland uh, to London. But this is a service which cannot merely be consigned to its glorious past. It demands active support in the present in order to secure a bright future. A bright future as an integral part of a wider and longer term plan for our public transport system. A plan that means instead of closing down booking offices and cutting jobs, we should be investing in our railway and cutting fares. Because if we are really serious about climate change, we should be getting people out of their cars and onto public transport. And when it comes to cross-border travel, we should be getting people out of their airline seats and onto railway carriages. Will the member give way? Uh, yes, I'll give way. John Mason. I, I thank the member and take the points he's made, but would you accept that until, if passengers are not returning to the railways as many as they did previously, there's a shortfall in money. We cannot just keep increasing the subsidy to the railways, can we? Richard Leonard. Well, it's not a subsidy, it's an investment. And if we are serious about climate change, we need to get people out of their cars onto public transport. Would the member take an intervention? Uh, no, I'll need to press on a little. No um, which is why uh, not only this parliament, but the workforce, their trade unions, the travelling public, the people deserve some straight answers this afternoon from the minister. Because the position is this. On the 5th of October last year, on the eve of the SNP party conference in Aberdeen, instead of making a ministerial statement or a ministerial speech in Parliament, the Minister for Transport issued a press release based on a carefully crafted reply to a government-initiated question announcing that Serco was being stripped of the sleeper contract and issued with a notice of termination. But then, exactly two months later, after the SNP party conference was all done and dusted, in reply to a series of written questions which I had tabled, the Minister for Transport was forced to reveal, with a smoking gun in her hand, that, I quote, an appropriate assessment of a direct award to Serco Caledonian Sleepers Limited was now being made. So the company... Yes, yeah. Minister Jenny Gilbert. I thank Mr. Leonard for taking intervention. Does Mr. Leonard understand that I am somewhat constrained by the UK legislation in this place, which I have no power over as a Scottish minister, which requires me to look at direct award, and if that is ruled out, then the operator of last resort arrangements, which of course we have in place for Scotland. Does he understand the process that I now have to go through as a Scottish minister? Richard Leonard. Yeah, yeah, yes, I understand the process and I'll come on to that because not only are you guided by the 1993 Railways Act, you are also guided by the 2016 Scotland Act, which devolves rail services to Scotland. And, and, the, and the truth of the matter is, the company that runs the Caledonian Sleeper calls for more public money to run the service. That request is assessed and rejected. Then 60 days later, the Minister is forced to admit that it is now lining up a direct award to that self-same company. Let me be clear, this is not just another run-of-the-mill ministerial U-turn, this is a governmental betrayal of the highest order. It goes well beyond the simple question of a train contract to the very values that define this government. Let me, rem me remind Parliament and the Minister, this is the same circle which presided over a culture of bullying and harassment of its own staff on the Caledonian Sleeper Service. This is the same circle which boosted its profits by 64% in 2021, hiked up the pay and bonus of its CEO by shamelessly exploiting the deadly COVID-19 pandemic as a money-making opportunity. And it's the same circle 
which for over a year conducted a reign of terror night after night among asylum seekers in Glasgow with its hostile lock change programme and forced eviction policy. This is who we are dealing with. So I say to the Minister today, it's not too late. It's not too late to do the right thing and bring this service into democratic public ownership. It's not too late to make a direct award to Scottish Rail Holdings because there is a clear legal, ba legal basis for bringing in a public sector operator under Section 25 of the 1993 Railways Act. So the burning question is this, has Scottish Rail Holdings been asked to be prepared to operate the Caledonian sleeper service? And if not, why not? And if not, will the Minister instruct them to do so today? Finally, there are some who will accuse me of making this demand out of some kind of rigid, dogmatic, socialist ideology. Well, I have to confess that I do stand here this afternoon guilty of the charge of standing up for an ideal. I do stand here guilty of the charge of holding the firm conviction that this natural private monopoly run for profit should be a natural public service run for passengers. I do plead guilty to the charge of believing that public ownership of the railway is economically rational, socially responsible, environmentally sustainable and is democratically unanswerable. I do plead guilty, but I also make this plea as well. This is a decision which rests in the hands of this Parliament and of this Government alone. It is both legally competent, but it is also morally correct. So this afternoon, I hope that the Minister is not, not only listening, but is hearing and is prepared to act, is prepared to act decisively to take this public transport service back where it belongs into public ownership. Thank you, Mr Leonard. I now call John Mason to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Mason. Uh, thank you very much, and I thank Richard Leonard uh, for bringing this subject for debate today. Uh, I have to say, I personally am enthusiastic about rail and use the train as often as I can. Uh, however, I have to say that the sleeper service is extremely expensive, and that is why I have not used it since new rolling stock was introduced. The most basic return fare, including a bed, is meant to be about £280. But when I looked at actual dates in the near future, it was more like £400 return with their classic ticket. By contrast, the last time I was in London, which was July, I travelled by West Coast daytime train and it was £77 return. All rail tra travel is heavily subsidised or invested in, if, if you like that term, and rightly so, normally by around 50%. And it's been reported that the average subsidy on the sleeper is £164 per single ticket. Broadly speaking, I'm in favour of public ownership in many sectors, especially when it is a public service and is virtually a monopoly. All the trains run on the same track and use the same stations, just as all our electricity runs through the same wires and our water through the same pipes. So the idea of competition in either the rail sector or the electricity sector is always going to be a bit artificial. Of course, it has to be said at this point that the Scottish Government is bound by West relevant Westminster legislation, which I think is principally the Railways Act 1993. So we do not have complete freedom to act, as we might want to if all rail powers were fully devolved. Richard Leonard's motion mentions profits for the private operator, and of course that may be the case. But equally, there can be losses. And I think that has happened with both Abellio for the ScotRail contract and for Serco with the sleeper. Therefore, public ownership is not without risks, and if there is a loss, then it is the public purse which has to foot the bill. I think there has sometimes been the illusion around nationalisation that somehow all the financial pressures will magically disappear. People talked as if bringing ScotRail into public ownership would automatically mean lower fares, higher pay for the staff and more frequent and improved services. But the reality is that income and expenditure still have to match whoever owns and operates our railways. We can, we can do all of the above, the fares, the, the pay and all the rest of it, but they still come at a cost, whether the owner is in the public or the private sector. Yes, we could increase the subsidy, but would that be the right thing to do at a time when the NHS and other public services are so under pressure? 
And let's be realistic, it is a tiny number of people who actually use the sleeper service, and unless they are using the seated coaches, they generally need to be fairly well off or have their employer pay for it. CERCO clearly has fingers in a lot of pies, and some of their work for the public sector may be of high quality and value for money, but as Richard Leonard said, those of us in Glasgow will not quickly forget how CERCO were involved with the Home Office in threatening asylum seekers with eviction just a few years ago. Now, I know this final point is a sensitive subject, but there is a balance to be struck between the needs of passengers or customers, as they seem to be called these days, and the needs of the staff who work on the railways. I think we all have to be clear that the passengers must come first, but that has not always been the case. Years ago, in the days of nationalised British Rail, those of us who were older remember the awful sandwiches, which were a standing joke throughout Scotland, England and Wales. Certainly at that time, it seemed that the railways were often run for the staff and the passengers were a bit of an afterthought. So by all means, let's take the sleeper into public ownership. But if we are to do so, let us also make the commitment that the passengers must come first and remember that we as politicians, together with the railway staff, are here to serve the public. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mason. I now call Graham Simpson to be followed by Neil Bibby. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Simpson. Thank you very much. And can I also thank Richard Leonard for securing this debate, uh, not least because it's always good fun hearing him speak and winding the clock back several decades. But that aside, this is an important topic to debate because it is a debate. We're not going to all agree on this. And it's an opportunity to hear from the Minister as we've yet to discover what she intends to do about the sleeper service. We do need to know because this, uh, this is an important and iconic service. Six mornings a week, a little piece of Scotland rolls into London, full of people ready to start their day. And the background to this debate was, of course, the announcement last year by the Scottish Government that the sleeper contract with Serco would be terminated halfway through this June. This was after the company wanted to discuss finances in the wake of the pandemic, it did seem a very sudden decision. Now, when ScotRail became NatRail on April Fool's Day last year, with the obligatory plaque unveiling by the First Minister, it followed years of negative publicity for Abellio. And that's not the background here. Since Serco started running the sleeper service, they've invested in new fleet. There are 75 new carriages, in less than four years. And when we look at revenue, it was falling when the contract was awarded. But since then, Serco have grown revenue by 48%, with 2022 incredibly being their best ever year. And this coming year looks set to be even better. And customers must like what they do. In fact, they've scored their highest ever customer satisfaction scores with full trains. Employee satisfaction is also up, despite what the RMT may say. So against that, it does seem strange for even Richard Leonard to be arguing for change, though for him, as he's confirmed, it is ideological. Presiding officer, Serco are clearly doing something right. I've not yet been on the sleeper, but I do hope to go soon on a trip to London, because for me, on a one-way trip, it offers great value for money when compared to other options. There are a range of ways to travel on the sleeper. You could just take a seat, or there's a choice of cabin options too, and there's lots of Scottish produce on board. Even the mattresses are from Aberdeen. Now, the minister has to make her mind up, and she has three options. The sleeper could re rejoin ScotRail, she could bring in an operator of last resort, or she could offer a direct contract award, which may be the best in terms of value for money. Now, I've spoken to Serco, and I hope the Minister will do so too. They are keen to discuss a direct contract award, which would mean Ministers having complete control of the contract, and that surely must appeal to the Government. Last month, Jenny Gorruth said she was assessing that option. So has she now done so? A cloud of uncertainty hangs over the sleeper service, which is unfair on staff. Now, I've outlined some of the options for the Minister. She needs to say what she plans to do and why, 
and she should set out the business case for that decision. How would taking the service off Serco help passengers and how would it help the taxpayer? With the current contract ending in June, we're running out of track. This government never said why taking ownership of ScotRail would be better and they never had a plan for making it so. And I hope the Minister doesn't repeat that mistake with the iconic Caledonian sleeper. Thank you, Mr Simpson. I now call Neil Bibby to be followed by Mark Rusko. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Bibby. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank Richard Leonard for bringing forward this important and timely debate. President Officer, the Caledonian sleeper is 150 years old this year. From the Victorian era up to the present day, it has been a vital and valued link between Scotland and London for travellers of all kinds. And now, more than ever, the sleeper has a potentially vital role to play as a means of low-carbon travel. The two most used domestic flight routes are between London and Glasgow and London and Edinburgh. There's clearly significant potential from modal shift from domestic flights to rail. A reliable, affordable and comfortable sleeper service can play a key part in this shift. It can and should play an important role in getting people back onto our railways and towards meeting Scotland's and the UK's climate commitments. It's also vitally important for our tourism sector. So for the sleeper to play this role, we need a world-class service and we need value for money for passengers and taxpayers too. Under the Circle franchise since 2015, President's Officer, we have had neither. Circle has not only failed on its franchise commitments, its running of the sleeper service has not been a particularly happy experience for either passengers or staff. A 2021 survey of Caledonian sleeper staff by the RNT found that nearly 60% of those suffered had felt harassed by management at work. Nearly half had felt bullied. Meanwhile, price hikes mean that a standard bed on the service is now up to £190 one way, out of reach for many, many people in Scotland. I do believe that many people in Scotland would far rather take the train to London, uh, but at prices like that, it is no wonder that many people have to opt to take a cheaper flight. As Richard Leonard said, despite the Yes, I will do it. Liam Kerr. Uh, I'm very grateful. Given that the current subsidy, as I understand it, is £164 per ticket, how on earth, going back to John Mason's contribution, could the ticket price be made any cheaper without huge funds being ploughed in from the public purse? Neil Bibby. Well, clearly, clearly there needs to be investment and subsidy in the railways. There always has been and there always will be. But we want a publicly owned railway that, that, uh, that reinvests the profits from those private companies into services. Um, and if we do that, we can make rail travel more affordable. Um, and as Richard Leonard said, despite significant cost and revenue risk being transferred to the Scottish Government for a number of years, CERCO has received fees for running the service. And indeed this week, Mr Kerr, CERCO reported an operating profit of £11.2 million. The public, however, pay the price. This is, as Richard Leonard's motion states, money from the public purse being used to fund the profits of a private operator. Presiding officer, there is a better way. I believe the case is clear that in June 2023, the Caledonian sleeper should be taken into public ownership. Such a step would mark an important move away from the in inefficient and costly fragmentation of our railways. It would stop public money going to fund private profits and instead see those profits channeled back into the network to the benefit of passengers and the public. And what is more, President Officer, we have a pre-established structure and model for doing this. Following ScotRail being brought into public ownership after the failure of Abellio, the, the structures are there to run the sleeper in the public sector alongside ScotRail. So my question to the Minister, though, is this. What is the Government's policy intention? Because as Richard Leonard said, uh, prior to her party conference, she appeared to be talking about public ownership. Recently, however, there seems to be talk of a direct award to Circle. So I hope today the Minister will deliver some good news to rail user staff and taxpayers by confirming today that it is her policy intention that the Caledonia sleeper will be brought into public ownership and run for the benefit of passengers, not private profits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Bibby. I now call Mark Ruskell to be followed by Liam Kerr. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Ruskell. Thanks. Um, can I also welcome the opportunity to debate the future of the Cali sleeper service and thank Richard Leonard for securing the slot. 
Um, fundamentally, I don't think we can deliver a people's ScotRail without a sleeper service that is fully integrated and operated in the national interest and run by a public company. And like many members, I I'm uncomfortable that a company that is better known for running detention centres and evicting people seeking asylum is currently the operator of a national rail service. I'm pretty sure that that on its own is not a valid reason to pull Serco out of the running of the franchise, but I would certainly get a better night's sleep on the train knowing that it was being run by an operator who actually reinvests its profits back into the national interest. A nationalised sleeper service should not just be at the heart of this government's vision for rail, it should also be at the heart of its vision for aviation, because there is no credible way to meet our climate targets without a reduction in unnecessary air miles. Short-haul flights within the UK and to continental Europe can and should be reduced, and the sleeper service should play its full part. Now, we've already seen rail overtake flying as the most popular mode of transport between Edinburgh and London. Rail's share of this market rose from 35% pre-COVID to 57% last year. And rail operators have been smart. They've understood the market well on the East Coast, and they've geared their marketing and their pricing to what people now need and also can afford post-COVID. Now, the opportunity to replicate the success with the sleeper service is there, but it will need better integration, and that must start with better ticketing and fair fares. With single ticket prices in the hundreds, the sleeper is simply not an affordable service at the moment. And nationalised or not, we need to be doing all we can to ensure the sleeper is a low-cost option competitive with aviation. Now, since the Eurostar terminal shifted to St Pancras, the opportunity for seamless connections to Europe have been there for rail passengers coming from and to Scotland. A passenger, for example, getting on a sleeper at Inverness only has one platform change to get to Paris, Brussels and now Amsterdam by the morning of the next day. But the lack of an integrated, affordable ticket remains the biggest stumbling block. So we need to think big. The Irish Taoiseach and the French President have already announced a combined ferry and train ticket that will link the two countries starting this year. It should also feature a big discount for young people. If there's time in hand, I'll take Mr Simpson. Graeme Simpson. Very quickly, does Mark Ruskell not accept that the, the sleeper service is in fact incredibly popular and the trains off, often run full? Mark Ruskell. Well, I don't think that is the case on every single journey. And I think the, what we've seen with the East Coast is operators getting very smart about the way that they're structuring their fare prices and the offerings that they're creating. I think more could be done with the sleeper service, particularly on integrated ticketing. And I want to return to that, presiding officer, because it's not just France and Ireland planning to ditch air travel. A new European sleeper train from Belgium to Berlin is launching in May with plans to expand the route to Prague. New direct rail services between Paris, Madrid and Italy are also getting ready to be launched next year. And our German Green Party colleagues have already been promoting a plan for a fully integrated European sleeper service at the European Parliament, including our Cali sleeper as a vital part of Europe's rail network. So Scotland should not be left out of this rail renaissance that is happening across Europe. Brexit has left us isolated and at times locked up in a 10-mile tailback outside of Dover. We need to be better connected, but of course most European rail services are being run by nationalised rail companies which have the vision and backing of their governments at their heart. We need a Cali sleeper run in the public, in in run in the public interest and integrated with the rest of Europe's national rail services. And I look forward to that vision and that day coming soon. Thank you, Mr Ruskell. I now call Liam Kerr to be followed by Carol Malkin. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Kerr. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to make a short contribution to this debate as someone who did actually used to use the sleeper. I used to commute to and from London on the sleeper, and I still take it reasonably often. And I readily recognise the Richard Leonard's claims of the significant social, economic and environmental contribution that the sleeper makes, having experienced firsthand the excellent upgrades to the rolling stock, the use of local produce in the buffet car and seen the in economic and net zero benefits to the North East in particular of bringing people in and taking them to London. But it's that experience that causes me great disquiet in 
the calls for nationalisation of this service. Because Richard Leonard, first of all, suggests he's persuaded of this model by analogy to ScotRail. Yet for anyone that uses ScotRail, as I do, but often can't, with Aberdeen having been cut off for much of last week, for example, that claim is extraordinary. And that leads to the fundamental question that hasn't been answered, whether nationalisation would of itself improve the service. Because after all, as Graham Simpson said, it's not helped ScotRail. Indeed, last February, Richard Leonard himself said in debate, we must encourage people back onto the railway in volumes that signal modal shift. Absolutely right. And he went on that this cannot be done in the context of ticket office cuts and closures, service reductions, and the increase in fares. Yes, of course. New baby. Thank uh, the member for taking the intervention. I mean, there is a difference here between supporting public ownership and the SNP's management of the railways. We would take different decisions from the SNP government that has been taken in the past year or so. Liam Kerr. I, I readily acknowledge the appalling decisions being taken by the SNP government. I think Neil Bibby makes a good point on that. But the fact is that these cuts are things that we've all seen since nationalisation. So my point being that public ownership of the sleeper service doesn't of itself improve the passenger experience, the staff experience, or indeed any other aspect. And it can't, because the motion which rails the public purse would not be expected to fund profits for a private operator of the service says that, but Richard Leonard clearly didn't bother to take even a cursory glance at the publicly available books which show Serco has lost over £60 million running the sleeper since taking up the franchise. And I remind him that the Transport Minister told me last year that uh, ScotRail's rail passenger services, which cost £266 million in 2016, would, by the end of 2022, cost an expected £407 million. So that's a parliamentary question I'll be putting in after this to see what it actually has been. And if Richard Leonard had done his homework, he'd know that the rise of work from home has cut fare income on the railways from £11 billion to £9 billion, which means that the only way to drive improvements on a nationalised railway I don't think I'll have time, Mr Leonard. I, I can allow a wee bit of time, a wee bit of latitude to shoot the member wishes. very quick, Richard Leonard. So if it's about all these people working from home, why are our motorways and roads coming into major city centres congested in the way that they are? We need to get the people out of their cars onto the railways. Liam Kerr. Yes, we absolutely do. And that is why, when Richard Leonard makes the point earlier that we need to deliver investment in the railway uh, and cut the fares, then he has to appreciate that the only way to do that and therefore drive people away from their cars and onto the modal shift that he rightly brings up and other members have brought up are threefold. You either... I think I the really members have really time bring time, Mark, as You either increase taxes on the people of Scotland, even those who never use the railway and are already subsidising journeys on the sleeper to the tune, as I said, of £164, and hypothecate any higher tax take to the railway, or you generate more money to invest in the sleeper by cannibalising other portfolios such as health or education, and no government's ever going to do that, quite rightly, which leaves the only option is to cannibalise the railway budget from within, doing as the Scottish Government has done to ScotRail. You reprofile railway funds by cutting ticket office hours, cutting staff, cutting services, ramping up fares to squeeze more from the smaller passenger base. So, presiding officer, there is absolutely no analysis under which nationalisation could deliver a better service for passengers, staff or the taxpayers of Scotland. And I go back to Richard Leonard's comments about the need for modal shift last year. And I absolutely support him on that, not least to achieve our net zero ambitions. But in the context of the Climate Change Committee telling this government how it's guilty of magical thinking when it comes to its net zero plans, I fear we've heard more of that in this motion. And I say to Richard Leonard, he must be careful what he dreams of, for if he were to ever nationalise the sleeper, he'd rapidly find it turning into his worst nightmare. Thank you, Mr Kerr. Uh, and I call Karen Mochan to be followed by Casey Clark, who will be the last speaker before I ask the Minister to respond. Up to four minutes, please, Ms Mochan. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I really want to thank uh, my comrade Richard Leonard for bringing this debate into the Chamber. It is such an important issue for us to debate, as we have heard across the Chamber today. The Caledonian Sleeper Service is one of the jewels of Scotland's rail infrastructure and represents a transport 
offering to the public that few other parts of the UK can really enjoy. The sleeper has been in operation since 1873, as we've heard, 150 years this year. And for many, it holds great memories. Even uh, our opposition uh, Tory members have, have mentioned that. Um, uh, and it, it connects us you know, across Scotland and the UK. And it does remain in popular demand to this day, despite the discussions we've had in the Chamber about the affordability at this present time. Now, uh, the member, uh, Graeme Simpson, mentioned that, that, that uh, you know, we were bringing this back to the Chamber you know, and taking us back in time. But in actual fact, I think the debate has shown from other members that in actual fact, we're talking about the way in which we sustain transport in this country. And we look at the environment and bringing people back into our railways to ensure that we, we can continue um, to have a, a, a proper look at, at, at uh, our carbon uh, footprint. I also want to talk a wee bit about the fact that I would associate myself with the comments that Richard Leonard has made around the fact that public ownership does bring huge benefits um, to both staff and to customers, if I can just uh, bring in John Mason's point. But it's important that staff and customers um, both you know, are, are seen as part of the equation. Um, if I can say that, you know, I do not believe that we should uh, hand this service back to Serco in June under any circumstances. And now is the right time, I think we have heard, to bring the sleeper back under public control through a government-owned company. And we have heard today in this debate that we can do that. And it, what better way to reward the staff um, of the sleeper service um, in this uh, you know, if we did bring this service back into a long-term future in public hands. I believe this would be popular, of course. Liam Kerr. Just listening to this, so it, it, let's say that happens. How are you going to, how is the member going to generate the money in order to pay for all of these benefits that are being brought in by nationalisation? Karen Morgan. Thank you. I think that the members on the opposite benches have to understand that this is a necessary thing for us to do. And Neil Bibby has also mentioned that we have always subsidised our rail railways, quite rightly so. And that if we look at the contribution from Mark Rusko, you know, we want to integrate ourselves into Europe and be part of that service. And there is opportunity for us to do that. And I believe we absolutely can do that. Privatisation of the rail railways has been a disaster in this country and, and across Europe and other European countries have done this so much better and have retained uh, the, the, that public ownership. The current operators, CERCO, are, are now in a situation where they're paid by us to run the service, whilst at the end of the day we take the risk associated with that anyway. An incredible situation in which private enterprise can extract fees in order to run public assets. And if anything goes wrong, they just send it back to uh, the public service anyway. When the railways across Britain were privatised, we were told it would increase competition and drive down costs, uh, costs for the consumer. Um, when we are seeing there is actually zero competition, zero risk to companies, whilst customers pay increasingly high prices and shoulder the long-term financial burden. Um, and, you know, that, that, cannot, you know, that cannot go on. Um, I, I want to just conclude by saying that um, I think it is a fantastic service that should be in public hands. And if this government is serious, it will soon take it back in to the public hands in the way in which it has been described we can do Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms Morgan. And I now call Katie Clark. Up to four minutes, please, Ms Clark. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I refer to my entry in the Register of Members' Interests and congratulate Richard Leonard on securing this important debate, which, of course, is part of a wider discussion about public transport and the climate challenge and how we get people to move from car and planes to rail in particular as the greenest form of transport. And I think we do need to compare where we are in this country, in Scotland, and indeed in the rest of the UK, with um, 
other European countries. In Germany, we know it is possible to travel by tra train throughout the country for €9. Euros. In Spain, most train travel now is free for another year. In France, they've recently obtained permission from the European Commission to ban domestic flights on routes where train is available. So I think, having listened in particular um, to Leon Kerr's um, contribution to the debate, it's very clear we need big decisions by the UK government as well as the Scottish government. Circo has operated the Caledonian Sleeper franchise since March 2015. Prior to that, it was integrated into the ScotRail franchise, and it was due to the COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic that in March 2020, Caledonian Sleeper was transferred um, on what's called an emergency uh, measures agreement, um, now a temporary measures agreement, um, so that all cost and revenue uh, risk was transferred to the Scottish Government, and Circo received a fee for running the services. So the risk is already with the Scottish Government, and Circo are eligible to receive fees, which indeed they have been doing. This debate is to encourage the Scottish Government to take Caledonian Sleeper back into public ownership. Uh, I would be happy to take um, an intervention for, from Graeme Simpson, as he's still standing. Graeme Simpson. Uh, thank you. Thanks for taking the intervention. Can the member tell us, because I haven't heard yet from anyone, what it is that Serco have done wrong? with the Caledonian Sleeper Service. Uh, what one speaker has actually said they've been running a very good service. Katie Clark. Um, I suspect that the member hasn't spoken to his member as many um, Caledonian sleeper employees um, as I have. Um, I think we could have a debate um, indeed on some of the practices that have operated in Caledonian sleeper um, in its own right. Um, I think we've already heard from Richard Leonard about some of the alleged bullying. Um, that's been taking place, um, but I think some of us have a dossier in terms of some of the problems um, in relation to how um, that service um, is operated. Um, the the a member um, from the Green Party has already spoken about some of um, Circo's behaviour in relation um, to people um, seeking asylum and bespoke um, accommodation. Um, we know also of their track record in test and trace. So I think there's some principled issues in terms of um, the kinds of organisations that government awards contracts to, um, but there's some very specific issues um, in relation to how Circo have operated sleeper services. And I would say that they are discredited and they're not fit to receive public money um, from the Scottish Government. But as I say, that's probably a wider debate um, that we could focus on um, in detail. I think the, the issue today before us um, is whether this is the best way for a public service um, to be operated. We know, um, I don't think we've got the specific figures, that, but we believe that nearly £2 million in fees have been given to Circo as part of the current contract. I'd ask the Scottish Government to confirm how much money Circo are receiving. And I would hope that over the coming months, as the Minister is making decisions, um, that she will take into account the very strong support that she has from the Scottish Labour Party in particular to bring the sleeper service back into public ownership. Thank you, Ms Clark. And I now call on Minister Jenny Gorruth to respond to the debate. Up to seven minutes, please, Minister. Uh, presiding officer, um, I congratulate Mr Leonard on securing this afternoon's important debate on the Caledonian sleeper. Um, I'm not sure how many MSPs in the Chamber have travelled on the sleeper, but I'd certainly encourage colleagues to experience it. It's a fantastic opportunity uh, to travel on the sleeper. I undertook it myself for the very first time in November, um, and it was a really enjoyable experience. Now, I think, as Mr Leonard and Mr Bibby noted, sleeper rail services have existed in Scotland for um, almost 150 years this year, I think it is, and that gives us that connectivity from Scotland to other parts of the UK. They're really essential in terms of the vital mix of rail services that we have in Scotland. Now, I've listened to this afternoon's debate with interest, and I do want to return to the members' points in turn. I think it's fair to say there are some different views in the Chamber, perhaps split along uh, ideological lines. However, I just remind members for context that it was this government that brought ScotRail into public ownership, and I think that's quite an important context to, to start from. Now, 
Absolutely. Neil Booby. Grateful. Uh, on the issue of ScotRail, obviously delivering better rail services requires real leadership. Chris Gibb is leaving his key post as Chief Executive of ScotRail Holdings after less than a year. The Scotsman has reported political interference was one of the factors in his decisions and linked it to the postponement of engineering works in Fife. Will the Minister confirm or deny this was the case? Minister. I recognise Mr Booby's um, outline of a, an individual and just to say to that individual his post came to an end this year um, so therefore the, the issues he's highlighted in the chamber are not my understanding of why Mr Gibb is leaving. If he would like to speak with Mr Gibb as I have done actually then he'd be uh, more than welcome to do so and I'm sure Mr Gibb can give him his own views on that matter but he's made a substantial uh, contribution to the first year of public ownership of ScotRail. I want to respond to some of the, the history actually around about the sleeper, but going back to the beginning of the sleeper in 1873, we had uh, trains that were journeys could last in excess of 11 hours. So obviously things have moved on since that time. We've got two sleeper services in the UK today. We have the Night Riviera from London to Cornwall and we have the Cali sleeper. The sleeper is really the prominent example, therefore, connecting communities in Scotland directly to London. And as important as the Caledonian Sleeper opens up travel, it opens up travel for people who live in Scotland, but also for visitors. And I think we heard some of that from members today. So recently we've really seen the balance... Happy to do Rosa so. Grant. The Minister will remember I wrote to her about some of the employment practices of Circle, especially about staff based in Inverness. They were making staff redundant with no hope of any redeployment without any consultation with the unions. And I wonder if she'll give that some consideration when she makes her decision. Minister. I thank the member for the uh, intervention. She makes an important point. I absolutely will give that consideration. I spent uh, an hour and a half yesterday with the real unions and we talked about this issue at length, as you will understand. So i uh, more than happy to look at that, particularly in the round of the future decision that I will need to make in relation to the future viability of the sleeper service and how that will be delivered. As I mentioned, presiding officer, there has been a shift in terms of our, our railway traffic, as it were, to the more tourist end uh, of the, the passenger outputs. And uh, I think Liam Kerr spoke to some of the kind of societal uh, benefits the sleeper service brings in terms of the economic benefits and the so social benefits. But as we started to recover from the pandemic, it's these services, these tourist services, essentially, that are driving growth in the Caledonian sleeper business, which I think is perhaps different from when Mr Kerr and others may have used the service historically when it was more of a commuter service. And as Graham Simpson, I think, noted, we have really quite high satisfaction levels from customers, and I think that's important to reflect today. Now, since the... Absolutely. Liam Kerr? It, uh, I think the Minister is right. It is really important to reflect on that. Now, Carol Mocken described the sleeper being run by Circo as a fantastic service. Uh, does the Minister agree with that? And if it ain't broke, why fix it? Minister. I recognise the Member's point. It's, Circo are running um, a broadly good service. I'll come on to talk about that in a bit more detail uh, as we progress. However, um, I think it is important to say that the rationale the decision reached around about the provision of services going forward was one based on value for money. We've spoken today at length. I've heard members make contributions on the importance of um, recognising the challenges we face in government in relation to the sustainability of public funding, uh, providing that subsidy. I think that's important to recognise. Now, uh, Mr S uh, Simpson actually noted some of the, the products on board, which of course are, are Scottish, and I think that's important too, to help the, the service that is run to support local communities and also to give uh, Visit Scotland an opportunity to um, promote Scotland to visitors who are coming uh, to Scotland and travelling from London, of course. Um, now, the success of the Cali Sleeper has surpassed any other train company in the UK. And I think that's actually a really important point. Circa have been running a broadly good service, as we've seen, as I mentioned, from passenger satisfaction levels. Its revenues from the last year outstrip pre-pandemic performance and its bookings are stronger than ever. So as a franchising authority, we have lifted the Cali Sleeper into new levels of success. Now, Scottish ministers historically, some years ago now, took the decision that the Caledonian sleeper would be operated separately from ScotRail services. That allowed uh, the level of dedicated management for that service, uh, which I think is actually hugely important in terms of how the service has progressed. So the service has evolved and with that has been able to, to make progress. Um, and I recognise there have been challenges historically, but it's important to put that on record. The policy decision, of course, was ahead of the resurgence of sleeper services across Europe, which I think we heard from Mr Ruskell, and the Caledonian sleeper it has established a model that has actually attracted attention from international sleeper operators, which is important to say. So we have in the Caledonian sleeper a service which is now thriving. That is quite unique in the current context on rail. There is a testament there as well, I think, to the quality and the attractiveness of the service, but also to the work of the staff. Um, and they continue, of course, to help in making the service as successful as it currently is. 
And as a service, it's increasingly recognised internationally, as I mentioned, and it attracts passengers from all over the world. Now, of course, there are challenges, and I very much recognise that the franchise has had its problems. I think we heard some of that from members this afternoon. The issues around about the introduction of new trains are well documented. Uh, bringing in a, a complicated fleet with ensuite facilities was pretty ambitious and challenging at the time. But we can also recognise the success that we have now with the strong recovery that I've mentioned and uh, moving forward from the pandemic. As we've noted in the discussion this afternoon, I have taken the decision not to accept the rebasing proposal received from CERCO um, at the end of last year. So the current franchise agreement will end on the 25th of June this year. I need to repeat that the decision not to rebase was in no way a reflection on the quality of the product that has been developed, nor on the commitment of the staff, as I mentioned, who deliver this service very well every day. It was instead a question of the terms of the rebase offer and that those terms did not represent value for money anymore. The decision about the arrangements that will replace the current franchise when it comes to an end in June need to be taken in accordance with the existing UK railway legislation. I cannot, as a Scottish Minister, unpick that legislation much as I may like to. And, of course, the Scottish Parliament, again, additionally, does not have the power to change that legislation, at least not at the current time. So, working within the constraints of that legislation, we're in the process of determining the arrangements to secure the continued provision of the Caledonian Sleeper Services beyond June. Absolutely. Richard Leonard. So she's referred a few times to um, Section 25 of the 1993 Railways Act, but does she not accept that Section 57 of the 2016 Scotland Act provides her with an opportunity to put this out to a tender process which would allow a public sector bid? Minister. I hear what Mr Leonard is saying. I don't think that the legislation he cited uh, recuses me from also adhering to the current UK legislation. That is the advice I take from my civil servants in Transport Scotland. If he has uh, legislative advice which contradicts the advice I'm receiving, I'm more than happy to consider that. But working within the constraints of the current UK legislation, I will move forward. And as I noted in my letter to the NZ committee uh, back in October, it's been determined that it would not be appropriate to pursue a competition for the reletting of the franchise at this time. Now, we do not consider that the prevailing conditions in the current UK rail market would sustain that option. The post-pandemic recovery on rail um, has created, I think it's fair to say, a substantial uncertainty and risk about future market conditions. So, in terms of the current railways legislation, the remaining options for successor arrangements are the direct award of a new franchise agreement or to mobilise operator of last resort arrangements, as was undertaken for ScotRail. Now, that work, as I mentioned, presiding officer, is well underway, noting that June is fast approaching, to consider those options in accordance with the current legislation and, of course, with Scottish Minister's franchising policy statement, and with the intent to deliver the best service, of course, for Caledonian sleeper passengers and the best value for the people of Scotland. Presiding officer, I congratulate Mr Leonard again on securing this afternoon's members' debate on the future of Caledonian sleeper. I have listened with interest to the contribution from members on how those services should be delivered from June, and I commit to update Parliament in the coming weeks on the new proposed delivery model, one which delivers for passengers and staff alike. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate, and I suspend this meeting until 2 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>